First of all, thank you, Ambassador, for allowing us to have this meeting here at the at the Brazilian Mission. Uh, it's uh, it's very nice to see all of you here, um, and uh, and I'm going to speak English uh, even to our Brazilians, but uh, since we have uh, the pleasure of having uh, foreign. Uh, journalists here. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, I, um, I think that uh, um, Rio Plus 20 is going to be uh, a very uh, interesting opportunity uh, in this period of, of crisis in which uh, countries are very much uh, stuck with uh, a very delicate national agendas uh, in which they have to deal uh, with uh, short term uh, um, issues and short term problems and uh, and in which uh, we are we have been seeing we have been following um, that uh, in many international meetings. Uh, this idea of solving the immediate problem um, is uh, is really the center uh, of uh, what we are seeing in the news uh, and uh, and Rio plus twenty is a conference uh, about uh, the medium and longer term so um, this is uh, in a certain way some people say, but how are we going to deal uh, with with that in the middle of a crisis? And if this is not going to be negative uh, for for a conference to be held uh, in a crisis context, uh, and we we are convinced uh, that um, maybe the crisis uh, is uh, probably the context in which uh, we 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 may open our minds to new ideas and to new perspectives uh, since. What, uh, that, uh, since what is here and now is not really working, so uh, there is so there is a double um, meaning that uh, our, our minister of foreign affairs uh, always interprets the, the the name Rio Plus Twenty as not only the 20 years after Rio 92, but as the 20 years that we have ahead of us. Uh, so I think this is the most. Uh, interesting part of Rio is that we may um, uh, in, uh, we may have uh, a new look at what uh, and uh, how we should organize our economies uh, for uh, the next 20 years. And I I used economies exactly because that is I believe the the main point of Rio Plus 20 because. Uh, it's about sustainable development, and sustainable development is a balance between the economic, the social, and the environmental uh, dimensions uh, of development. Uh, but we know that in the last 20 years since Rio, although the, the concept of sustainable development was widely accepted, um, at the same time it was mostly associated with an environmental agenda. And uh, we believe that what can be a big change in Rio uh, uh, this year uh, is for uh, sustainable development to become also the paradigm for economic way of, uh, of the economic uh, um, administration of countries and multilateral uh, also. That is why uh, we believe that uh, uh, the mainstreaming of sustainable development into the economic and social agendas is one of the main uh, um, objectives uh, of this conference uh, in June. So, in that sense, it is very logical uh, to associate, uh, to expect something uh, interesting in this period of crisis, because since sustainable development, uh, I believe that when we look at the last 20 years and we analyze today, uh, we see that the idea of sustainable development is still very valid, is still very contemporary, this balance between the three things. 
but we have seen also that it has been sometimes limited to certain sectors in some countries. I mean, no country has achieved sustainable development as a whole, but some sectors of the economy of some countries have made significant advances in the direction of sustainable development. But um, uh, I, the feeling we have when we are discussing with uh, all these such different countries as we have uh, 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 discussing these documents uh, is that, um, that sustainable development is the right answer. And in those 20 years also after Rio, sustainable development has been, I believe, strengthened uh, by the debate and the enormous discussion surrounding climate change because climate change in 92 was a far away theoretical thing when we had the convention signed in Rio in 1992 many people thought it was uh, completely uh, um, uh, an anticipation an excessive anticipation of a problem that people did not think was that serious uh, and after those 20 years uh, sustain, um, uh, climate change has become basically the, the, the biggest negotiation we have today. So it's interesting to see that uh, sustainable development is also the answer to climate change. And this in 1992, we were not uh, uh, aiming at that when we were defining uh, uh, sustainable development. So we believe that the, the concept has been strengthened by the, 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 the international and national circumstances, so sustainable development is the right way of thinking, but it has been very much uh, isolated in an environmental agenda, and it has to be uh, used more widely in the social and the economic agenda. And I think this will also give a certain logic to what world we want after that crisis. We know we have an environmental crisis, we have a financial crisis, we have a job crisis, we have uh, many crises at the same time now. Uh, s s in some countries, many of these crises together. And, and the fact is that sustainable development is the answer to that. And so uh, I was struck by... Um, uh, someone who told me that he was very impressed that all these things about the Greek crisis, for instance, uh, if there was anyone thinking about the sustainable development of Greece while dealing with the crisis of Greece. You know? uh, and, and it's true that when we see the social impact of the way we're fighting this crisis and on probably very little worry about the environmental impact of how we're dealing with this crisis. So I think that uh, uh, um, it's, it will be very good to uh, wake up the idea that sustainable development is uh, something that is achievable and that has to be taken into consideration in these times of crisis and thinking of the future. So this is just uh, an introduction and uh, I'm will be delighted to answer your questions because I'm sure you're going to to yes, go ahead. Uh, there will be a round of negotiations here in New York this week, right? So what do you expect to achieve in this in this round here? Mm -hmm. and, and how sh should we measure uh, the success of the Rio Plus twenty conference since there are no there's gonna be no sort of that are going to be imposed on or even agreed by all Now, uh, this is a very important uh, and the very first question to be answered. Um, uh, the, the title of the conference, Rio Plus 20, uh, immediately uh, um, obliged us to have Rio 92 as a conference, as a reference. No? Uh, and, but, in fact, they are completely different conferences, because in 1992, um, what we saw in Rio was uh, the, the result uh, of uh, a series of negotiations that had been happening for many years and that culminated in Rio in 1992, the climate change, the, uh, the biodiversity, Agenda 21, the principles of Rio, all these negotiations had some of them uh, taken years, 
uh, and in 1992 you signed all these things and you started a new chapter with these negotiations ended. Um, what we are seeing uh, is that um, the, the, the countries, uh, the, the negotiations at the UN are, are showing that what we're going to have uh, in Rio plus 20 is in fact uh, the beginning of a series of processes. Uh, they have a clear direction uh, which first is the strengthening of sustainable development as a concept, as I told you, the mainstreaming of sustainable development, and then also a desire to strengthen the um, uh, governance structure uh, dealing with sustainable development in the multilateral arena. So uh, these two things uh, are going to be uh, discussed uh, starting uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, because we have to translate that into a document that is at the same time useful and convincing and practical. No? But what I believe this document is going to show, and I think that uh, Regina Maria Teresa uh, know that probably better than me, uh, is that we have a feeling that yes, most countries want to start in Rio a series of processes that <laughs> Uh, will uh, uh, strengthen uh, um, uh, the sustainable development for the next 20 years. And these processes, for instance, include, as you know, there is the idea of sustainable development goals, for instance, which would be something that I believe uh, uh, will be a very important achievement. Uh, but not only that, because this is very uh, symbolic, uh, but also um, uh, a series of things that are parallel to that, but uh, I will explain very quickly. This is not, I must say, the result already, but it's a logic that I, I see very positively coming ahead, which would be for, for, real, for us to really have the mainstreaming of sustainable development, you have to have a series of instruments. One of these instruments is the information. So. Um, we have noticed, we countries, we have noticed that we have very good individual analysis uh, of the situation of the world in some areas like the FAO does with agriculture or um, the UNEP does with environment or the IMF in the financial sector. But we have not so much integrated these things the, the, uh, in a way that we see the very strong connections between these things. So, for instance, energy, there are lots of people talking about energy and water and things like that. These connections, I believe, uh, is something that we have to develop very much. So, this is one area in which I believe it would be uh, we can have an interesting process starting in Rio, which is to have uh, um, uh, an analysis, a capacity to analyze the connection between all these issues that are being dealt by individual institutions, multilateral institutions that we have already formed. So this connection of information will obviously help enormously to have sustainable development goals and to be able to analyze sustainable development goals. Um, this also enters into a discussion on indicators, which is not something that all the countries agree on, but indicators that would allow us to see uh, these issues in a different way or with different elements. I think this is also important. And finally, a structure that would take into um, uh, account all the discussions in uh, uh, from environment to agriculture to energy etc and uh, to take them together into something that will deal uh, with development as a whole uh, which means uh, some people think talk of a council of sustainable development or whatever but the the, the title or the name is not so important the important thing is to have at a certain moment which is something we tried with CSD but did not uh, work uh, so well, uh, which is um, uh, an opportunity uh, in which uh, the, the countries really discuss internationally this connection of all these issues. That's why uh, World Bank, uh, WTO, 
uh, IMF has to be very much involved also with all the UN uh, institutions, uh, the other UN institutions, because in principles they are the, in the UN system, uh, and uh, so that we have a coordination uh, between the logics. And we know that, uh, that uh, it's very difficult to coordinate these logics because this coordination is very difficult inside countries. The ministries of agriculture, the ministries of the environment, the ministries of industry and the ministries of energy normally inside any country uh, don't like so much to have to deal with the others uh, with, uh, when they are doing their policies. But I believe that this is the fourth dimension which would be the dimension of having this inside countries, because you cannot expect to have a multilateral structure uh, that uh, w in a certain way is not reflected in what countries are doing internally uh, because um, uh, you ask any country uh, and uh, the WTO negotiator of this country uh, sometimes says things in the WTO that is different from what the same country is saying at the uh, FAO or the same country is saying in another negotiation because people have a different way uh, of dealing with these issues inside their countries and obviously this is reflected in the multilateral dimension. And so we have to have, like I believe, a strengthening of the sustainable development logic inside countries in the multilateral arena, in a council or whatever like that, then have the, the instruments, which would be something like the, uh, the indicators and the information and the analysis of how we can really uh, make a difference uh, of, uh, uh, of having sustainable development goals that really will make a change. And to really make a change, it has to have economic uh, logic. That's why we come back to the issue uh, of having it of having sustainable development as the uh, as a paradigm for the economic uh, sectors of countries and the economic multilateral so Brazil, institutions any goals in terms of sustainable development? Uh, um, Claudia who just entered here uh, is coming is coming from a retreat organized by Colombia uh, on the issue of sustainable development goals uh, and, um, uh, and so many ideas are uh, appearing as you saw it was uh, it is mentioned in the zero draft this is one of the areas where I think we can have an interesting result uh, uh, Claudia um, how was it? <laughs> <She's>, uh, <laughs> this is really latest news she just arrived from the retreat <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah. The 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 main uh, the two things I I think are interesting there. One is to, in a certain way, to to as a demonstration that from Rio plus twenty we're going to have the beginning of a process. No, we're going to 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 define that process and we're going to be able to go ahead. Some countries would like to have, as Claudia said, uh, already in Rio some of these. Some others want it in fourteen. But I, I, I want to take the opportunity to, to say how different they would be from the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals were extremely important um, uh, because they um, um, inspired, um, the, I think, the, the general public uh, because it was something that is, is easily understandable and that you could check the results, which is something extremely important uh, for, for people to believe in multilateralism. No? Uh, so, but the Millennium Development Goals are goals uh, overwhelmingly directed to uh, extreme poverty, no? extreme um, uh, lack of resources, extreme lack of education, of uh, medicine, etc. Et so uh, this was uh, an, a great effort, a very important effort, directed to uh, less developed countries or least developed regions of countries. No? Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals is, are a completely different uh, in the sense that they, they are uh, to be uh, f um, followed and, uh, and uh, uh, done by, by developed countries also. So uh, it's not only, you know, because obviously when you say um, uh, eliminate illiteracy, um, whatever, this for the United States or for most European countries and many parts of the world in Japan, this is not an issue. So uh, this is an issue for, uh, for developing countries. But the Sustainable Development Goals have to touch uh, all the economies in the sense that the, the solution to sustainable development is not only to change the way that developing countries should develop themselves. It has also to affect the way that developed countries have achieved development. So... Um, uh, and this is something uh, that uh, I believe is extremely important because uh, it relates to another result of Rio Plus 20 which we believe is very crucial, which is the issue of unsustainable patterns of production and consumption, which is also a document we hope we are going to have in Rio. Uh, why is it related? Because the way developed countries develop themselves, they themselves admit that is a way of development that cannot work for uh, uh, the whole world because it is uh, uh, it uh, needs enormous resources, etc. Um, there was a, a very good sentence a long time ago from Gandhi that I like very much. Uh, he said that the United Kingdom had to deplete half of the world's resources to be developed. And then he asked, "How many planets will India need?" to develop itself. So, uh, in a certain way, we have uh, to, to question the, um, uh, the, the, the standards of development uh, and the way of life, the lifestyle, uh, that, ironically, at the same time that countries say, we have to change the way we develop, we all know that all the companies are absolutely delighted uh, to have the whole world consume what developed countries consume so that they increase their market. So we have to have a good balance between these two things. You cannot have at the same time developed countries saying that developing countries should do different things and at the same time send their companies to those countries and try to sell as many cars as possible, as many everything as possible and have a lifestyle uh, that is extremely attractive. That is the problem. Uh, we, we know that in most countries today, whatever China, Brazil, or whatever, we have a growing middle class, fortunately, but this growing middle class obviously is very much attracted by a way of life that we know is a way of life that is uh, unsustainable. So um, that's why sustainable development goals are very much linked to unsustainable patterns of production and consumption. It has to affect the way developed countries are living. 
you, developed countries, some people in developed countries think, no, that's okay. If the Chinese and the Brazilians uh, don't have a, a, a consumption pattern we have and live reasonably well, we can continue to have our own way of life. This, this is not possible. So, um, uh, I think that this is a very, very important discussion because uh, it will be dealing with the real world. The real world is that the develop, developed world is in deep crisis and some developing countries are showing a, a, a very uh, exciting uh, a change uh, in the patterns uh, uh, of, uh, in the way of life of their population. I mean, you have a growing middle class in many developing countries. So, and this is what is moving the international economy at the moment. So it is very important that we deal with the real world. No? Uh, because in 1992 we still believed there was one way of developing that if everybody followed this way of development this would be a way that countries would achieve development. Now we know that there are many ways of good getting uh, development, but they have to be adjusted to the reality of every country. And countries have shown an amazing variety of intelligent ways uh, of development. But we have to make sure that all these ways of development incorporate sustainable development as a paradigm. Master, can you give some examples of what developing countries can propose a, like a, a practical example of what they can ask for developed countries to do to achieve it? Uh, it's, it's very easy. Uh, um, uh, you, you can, um, the, the main issue, and that this in a certain way comes back to the, the issue, for instance, of emissions. No? Um, uh, energy is an area uh, in which we have many countries that have uh, um, a reasonable mix of renewables and non-renewables uh, and, and countries that have found completely different solutions. It's very interesting to see, for instance, in Europe uh, that Germany and France have, are two extremely developed countries, the two richest countries in Europe, and they have decided to have completely different solutions for energy. France is 80% nuclear, uh, which is very good for emissions. Uh, and Germany is abandoning this. So uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting to see that you have very different answers, even in very similar economies. Uh, and um, maybe Germany is going to develop and uh, lower the price of some new energies. This may be a very interesting path. But the fact is that developed countries have to do their homework too. You cannot only look at developing countries that they should be doing something. So, in a certain way, developing countries are um, much more relevant economically. If, if you compare in 1992 the relevance of China, India, and Brazil, and you compare this today, it's a completely different thing. So, we have to have answers that take into consideration this change. But we have not to interpret this change as these are the countries that have to do the things. No, not at all. Uh, uh, these countries are giving new opportunities in the world economy. And how can we uh, take the, this opportunity of having billions of people entering the market force, entering the consumer uh, um, um, world, uh, how can we, uh, for instance, uh, take this opportunity of the scale of people that are entering the middle class, which is something that is absolutely unprecedented in, in, in the economy. You're having billions of people joining the middle class in a few years. This opens amazing opportunities. But these opportunities, at the same time, should not be um, used for selling the usual stuff or, or, or inspiring a way of life that we know that is complicated, but this basis of the change uh, have to come from the countries that have the financial and the technological resources. They should be the countries that uh, should also be looking at these new opportunities in a much more sustainable way. Do you think, sorry, do you think one of the, the proposals could be uh, going ahead with the plan to pay for the, the forests in the countries that still have forests? This is a different issue. I think this is a different issue. This is a, an important issue, but this uh, is um, 
uh, I think that this is not mainstream. I'd just see. like to have a yeah. more example apart yeah. from energy, apart from emissions. Uh, well, emissions covers, including this issue of forests, etc. So I think that emissions is all over. But let's say transportation, for instance. Uh, uh, some European countries have succeeded to have public transportation that has such a quality that people don't mind not having a car or using much less the car. This is a different model than the American model, which is the model that some countries are adopting. So the issue of transportation is key. The issue of energy is key. The issue of um, uh, how do you deal uh, with uh, garbage, etc., is obviously a big issue. There is a colleague. I, I do apologize. Yes, yes, she has asked for the floor. I have two, two yeah, questions. but she has One, to be. Okay. I'm sorry. There are good models, like the development of the internet, which was based on research directed by government, by scientists and and, and, and academic. Absolutely. And it, it went more than ten years ahead. It went to create a whole new way of doing things Absolutely. that save all kinds of things. Yeah. And so there are these good models, but they're not. They're, they're not what we can conceive of now. They have to be built by a research community. Mm -hmm. That's and that I thought it's also they have the corporate world couldn't do that. It had to be a government research yeah. community with academics very very much in charge of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if in your model there is some of this you know a, a sense of how important this aspect is because this is what can create the new things we need. And then the other piece is the mm -hmm. governance aspect, which the internet made the feedback possible from grassroots in the process of developing yeah. it. And it continues that in, in various places it's being used that way. So I'm wondering what the governance, what you mentioned, there has to be a change in governance. There are many people upset with the IMF and the, and the other organizations. And so putting them in connection with each other without serious attention to governance and to grassroots participation mm -hmm. in some way could be could be the opposite of what is being looked for. So yeah. those, those two aspects. Now, yeah, concerned. I think that, uh, that this issue is a, a key issue, but in a certain way, uh, as some call, these were like accidental uh, huge progresses, because as you said, the Internet was created for a much more modest uh, um, uh, reason, no, well, between... Had yeah, they had, they had a vision, vision but I think that nobody could imagine it would gain the dimension it has gained they today. Did. They yeah. had that idea on the earliest development. I've done the research yeah. on that, and I'd be glad to share No, I'm absolutely they delighted that, uh, that, uh, that they had this ambition. But I can give you another example, which are cell phones. Nobody developed cell phones for social reasons. And cell phones have become one of the most revolutionary social uh, uh, issues in developing countries, from uh, bank transfer to the capacity of people to have a phone and be working and answering the phone. I mean, uh, this uh, cell phones, I believe, is probably uh, 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 an amazing uh, progress also. I, I believe that we have many technological uh, um, uh, advances that were made in medicine, we have been following that for many years. Uh, we have some fascinating things that have happened and that have been well used um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, this, all this has helped this creation of this middle class in developing countries. No? Um, how do you uh, deal with that? Uh, uh, is, is one of, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, the challenging thing that we have in front of us is if we are going to be able to have an institutional structure that will really help to use the best possible way these kinds of ideas. But we know that some political uh, elements that enter have killed some very good ideas or have limited some very good ideas to go ahead. Uh, another example, I believe, is, for instance, uh, uh, construction material. How do you do low-income um, uh, buildings with the quality and with less uh, emission and more quickly and that costs less to maintain? All these things we have today. But how do you take this to so many parts of the world and at the same time see that in developed countries the effort in that dimension is still very limited. 
obviously you have some countries where you have thanks to the level of uh, um, income of the population you have been able to uh, um, put a price on water put a price on uh, heating put a price a high price on all on, on lots of these things and this has inspired for instance uh, um, energy uh, uh, lower energy consumption in many countries, but it's starting from a, a high level. Yeah. Uh, I think that's real problems of a high price inspiring energy, you know, saving. It's, it's, you have to make these things available. And of course. No, no, what I'm saying. No, no, but uh, what I'm saying is that in developed countries, these things were achieved because you have raised the price. Many people, most people in Germany are putting double, uh, started to put uh, double glass because of the price of the heating, not because it was good for the environment. And that they that got is the point. They got, they, they got discounts and tax breaks. Absolutely, look at that. And only rich countries can do that. But, yeah. but it wasn't because of the high price, it was because of the incentives to, to use the alternative technology. It was the opposite. And, and no, I think that you are a bit, uh, a bit an idealist because if you see the, the numbers, you see that uh, unfortunately, even in developed countries, the, the, the consumption patterns are mostly guided by the price than by uh, uh, the future uh, of, uh, of the planet or the circumstances in other countries. But the fact is that th we have amazing information today to do the things right. If we can help creating a, a governance structure that helps understanding that we have all these instruments in our hands and that we can use these instruments, this would be also a great achievement of that. But, but how do you involve the people in this? Because so that you have some feedback and you have the people participating in the process. Yes. Is that part of your plan? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Because the, 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 the big difference between Rio uh, uh, in Rio Plus 20, we hope, is that it's going to be a conference in which uh, um, non-governmental uh, influence will be higher than in any other UN conference. And uh, not only at the NGO level, uh, at the academic level, and the scientific level, and business level, but also on uh, regional and city levels, because we believe that we have seen in many countries that cities have found amazing answers, communities have found amazing answers, and these answers are not known by others, are, are not being uh, uh, used by others. And, and we believe, we hope that from Rio Plus 20 on, the UN will be able to uh, listen to that much better than now, because now, unfortunately, governments, uh, federal governments, no, the uh, national governments are the ones that have a voice. And national governments, for many reasons, favor one thing or the other. Uh, so I, I, I believe that is key. I mean, the communities, the cities, the regions, and the institutions have to have a stronger voice. Because governments, naturally, I'm suspicious because I work for the government, so I think governments can still do lots of very nice things and very well, uh, but we believe we have to listen more to the others. I'm just curious, yeah. where are America and China on these? Because in terms of consuming most of the natural resources and admitting they're both very mm. big, this, but you've got two different profiles, one which is considered a developed country and one which is still considered a developing country, mm -hmm. even though the economy is the third largest in the world. Where do they stand on these issues that are being discussed? Because where they go, um, I think a lot of uh, other people, the, well, the earth will have to follow. And then the question is, I think one of the failures of Rio uh, 92 was the emphasis that the, the developing countries would be allowed to ignore the emission standards. And this was the justification that the Americans gave for not signing on to the Kyoto Accords. So again, we have a structure where you're saying, we, well, the developing countries have this onus on them. And until it becomes glaringly evident that this is a problem to the average person in a country like the United States or someone in China who is looking to achieve all of the stuff that they see the Americans have, um, this may not be a practical way to put the problem forward. So where do you see America and China? In, in I think that America and China have... Um, uh, are, are being extremely 
um, uh, active in uh, this uh, in this process. Um, in what way? I'm going to tell you how. Uh, because uh, in America, like in most countries and like in China, you have uh, different economic interests regarding one direction or the other. So we all know, whatever country we're talking about, uh, that normally countries are more pressured by the, the less advanced uh, sectors of their economies. I mean, normally it's the sectors of the economy that are more afraid of changes, that, that uh, are heard because they are much more noisy than the ones that have that are embracing opportunities that don't need the support of government or that are, let's say, uh, structured in a way that they don't need so much the government. So I, I think that in the United States, uh, regarding uh, these issues, you have some of the most, most amazing technological advances and some of the most amazing companies uh, that uh, have been created in this country and that uh, have been able to give answers uh, to many of these issues and uh, that may be not adopted in their own countries or in some of the states of their own countries but that these ideas are going to be adopted uh, in other countries. The same thing about China. China, as we know, has uh, um, uh, amazing, uh, is investing amazingly in technological advances in some sectors uh, and some of these things are still not mainstream maybe in some of the regions or in some of the uh, um, uh, in some of the solutions, but the fact is that um, uh, we have to look at uh, these problems. That's why I was mentioning this issue of the cities and the issues uh, of the regions and uh, uh, of NGOs, etc. Is that the fact that the country as a whole is not adopting a policy does not mean that this policy is not advancing significantly inside this country. And I think that this is, uh, in international negotiations sometimes people expect from uh, countries to have an attitude that may mean to this government that they would have to take uh, um, huge investments uh, um, uh, at the moment that maybe they think they cannot do that. But this does not mean that in that country you are having an enormous progress uh, in an era. I can give you lots of examples, but you know that in America you have lots of those examples. So uh, I think that if we uh, are able uh, to, uh, to, in a certain way, um, show that you have answers being found, uh, for instance, in a region of Brazil, that are much more adapted to Mozambique than for another region of Brazil. This is something that is extremely important to be supported. And nowadays we still have this very national way of seeing the thing. Uh, uh, and also, like the cooperation, all these issues, have a profile that is still stuck to that structure that has disappeared, which is the north-south, very clear separation. Okay, can I just suggest, right, what you're saying is the extra-national, we go beyond the national, mm -hmm. the internet, the free interconnectedness, but there's another non-national interest which is very large, which is big oil, mm -hmm. and they have a lot to lose from sustainable development. Do you see any way to embrace big oil or create, to cre create a more sustainable um, a more sustainable model with them as partners, because profit-wise it's not really... Yes, big oil is a big issue. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but we all know that we are not going to uh, eliminate the importance of oil in uh, the next uh, uh, series of decades. Uh, and at the same time that um, we are going to lower the, the use of oil, we hope to lower the use of oil everywhere. We also know that we have an amazing increase of the number of people that are going to consume. So you are going to lower pro probably the per capita consumption of oil, but by the number of people incorporated in the economy, you are probably going to continue to have a very high uh, consumption of oil, but a more intelligent consumption of oil, uh, including Brazil being now a country that has discovered a considerable amount of oil uh, is uh, extremely 
interested in how to use oil the most intelligent way, uh, uh, conscious of its uh, impact uh, on emissions, but also conscious on the, the positive uh, uh, impact that it has uh, on uh, development. So uh, I think that this is, these are issues that have to be dealt with. I mean, we cannot say that big oil is going to be against this agenda. We have seen uh, surprising efforts by oil companies, surprising efforts by oil countries, uh, and I think it is very much linked to that. I think that the consumption, the, the reduction of the consumption per capita, but not at all the elimination of their, econ uh, their economic relevance. Did I answer? <laughs> as much as you could, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the host country trying to reach the gap between what developed countries and what developing countries want to see the help from government. Because, you know, as we mm. discussed, it, there's a lot of different things that they want to see. How, how are you planning to? Yeah. Well, uh, I have to say that Brazil, uh, chairing this, uh, this conference, uh, Brazil uh, is interested in consensus. I mean, Brazil wants to have results in this conference. Uh, and I think we are uh, well positioned to do that by the fact that we have a country in which all the realities coexist. Uh, we, um, the, there was a, an old Brazilian ambassador uh, that, you, that once a young diplomat came to him and said, I have to leave the dinner because I have to prepare the speech on Brazil that I'm going to do tomorrow morning. And then the ambassador said, you don't need to leave the meeting, the dinner, to do that. And they said, no, ambassador, I have to write the speech. And then the ambassador told him, no, you don't need, because anything you say will be true. So say whatever you want about Brazil, it's going to be true. It's a high-tech country, it's a country that has poverty, it's a country that has extraordinary cities, it's a country that has tremendous injustices. So everything is true about Brazil, so you can say whatever you want. So uh, in a certain way, we have a position in this conference, uh, which is a country that at the same time has been growing considerably, but we still have uh, unfortunately, a poverty that is uh, um, that we wouldn't like to see. We have all the situations, and we have extreme uh, uh, wealth. We have unsustainable patterns. Also, we have all the, the the agenda. The whole agenda fits in Brazil. So we are in a little something like a synthesis of this thing, with the right, and um, uh, very often with the wrong too. So we. We understand, I think, that uh, in that sense, Brazil can contribute a lot because we have some sectors in Brazil that perfectly understand the richest countries and we have some sectors in Brazil that perfectly understand the poorest countries. So we are going to try to use that uh, uh, to, to find um, as much balance as possible, as much consensus as possible, because this is our agenda. We are dealing with all these issues in our country and in our effort uh, towards sustainable development. So I hope we can really contribute and at the same time learn the best answers for our own sustainable development. And as a follow-up, what do you see as the biggest challenge to achieve consensus? Hmm. Uh, I think that uh, that's my personal opinion. Uh, I, uh, I think that, uh, and at the same time, it's the most exciting. Uh, it is the, um, the acceptance that this is an economic agenda, more than anything. Because if you mainstream sustainable development, there is enough money to do everything we, we need. If you see the numbers of international investment, international transfers, all the money that you have today in the world, if you can direct all the money that is being used today towards uh, uh, development that takes into consideration sustainable development, the three pillars, there is enough money to do the right thing. We, we cannot think sectorially, you know. We're going to make mainstream investments and then we're going to have like 10% for sustainable development to say that we are progressing with sustainable development. No, I think that this, the mainstreaming of it, I think, is the, the biggest challenge. If we succeed to do that, uh, uh, I think that um, 
we we can look at the the, the next 20 years you no know, as the the title should uh, invite uh, in a much more logic way so everything we do now taking into consideration that logic which absolutely doesn't happen can you tell us more about the strategy about not having a final document that is legally binding this issue of not having a document that is legally binding i don't think it's an issue i think that uh, um, what you what you sign uh, in Rio uh, is going to be uh, uh, we, we don't know yet because we cannot prejudge but um, but the document is not going to be a treaty, you know. It's a, it's a very different thing than, for instance, what we are dealing in uh, biodiversity or in climate change, in which you are negotiating a document and in a, in a, a logic of negotiation that is a, uh, that is a negotiation that advances every year. I think uh, th your question is quite important uh, because. Sometimes, uh, uh, in many uh, uh, papers and in many governments, people uh, sometimes think of Rio Plus 20 as uh, a process like the COPs or conferences like the COPs, uh, and even sometimes uh, thinking that Rio is related to the climate change, etc. It's obvious that Rio is related to climate change and to biodiversity and to oceans and to all a series of issues that are being dealt uh, by uh, processes in the United Nations. But Rio is a kind of conference that only happens every 10 or 20 years. So it's like uh, um, you stop a little the agenda and have to think and ha how you're going to continue. So the logic of legally binding documents is much more linked to what is being negotiated in the conventions, for instance, the, conven the Climate Change Convention, uh, w because it's uh, a continuous negotiation, which is not the case of Rio. Rio is, uh, um, um, belongs to a family of com conferences that are more, you know, conferences in which you stop to really think in the long term. And then legally binding documents is, is basically what you do uh, in the context of negotiations that are ongoing negotiations. So this is a really, you know, a kind of conference that doesn't fit into that definition. Excuse me. Um, are you, uh, thank you, Ambassador. Um, are you discussing uh, the nuclear energy as well? Because nuclear energy affects economics, mm. environment, development, and all issues. Well, uh, uh, energy is one of the key issues uh, uh, that uh, that is uh, that is being dealt with because energy uh, um, uh, there there is no development without energy. So, in that context, obviously, uh, nuclear energy is going to be uh, discussed. But uh, when we're dealing with the documents, um, uh, the. We, we are not negotiating here a specific document on energy. We are dealing with the uh, options that we have. Um, so uh, I don't know how in the document we're going to, 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 to have the final text on energy. You know very well that some countries want to, to, to give... Um, uh, nuclear energy a stronger role, uh, but you also have some countries that have decided that they are very, uh, that they will be very tough on nuclear energy. But, but, um, but this is not um, um, uh, a document that, uh, as you were saying, uh, is going to be legally binding and you're going to decide that nuclear energy is good or nuclear energy is not good. Uh, this nuclear energy will be dealt with in the context of energy, like uh, like um, uh, oil is going to be dealt with, etc. But obviously, the accent is much more on renewables, uh, uh, and renewables um, that have to be economically viable. No? So, the sustainable development needs that economic pillar. It's useless to not having a kind of energy that makes economic sense for a country to go to uh, an energy that requires subsidies or things like that if the country cannot afford it. So it's, it's, energy is a very, very complex issue, and that's the reason why we don't have uh, an international uh, agency uh, that is universal dealing with energy. Now you have the, 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 
one from the OECD, basically you have others, but you don't have one universal on energy, you don't have an international convention on energy, because energy, because it enters obviously the arena of uh, oil, is an extremely complex issue. So we're not going to solve this issue, obviously, in Rio. But we are going to look at the future of energy and how this can be uh, dealt with by countries in the context of sustainable development. Hi, can I just ask you a yeah. very existential question? Is with Rio 92, we as journalists had a great subject because we had global warming and this imminent threat and this treaty that was coming out at the end of it, or hopefully would come out. We had a lot of world leaders. We had a big focus on it. And I think that threat has gotten lost in sort of how can we make people, the ordinary people, interested in Rio plus 20 and not let it become a model of good intentions and policy and, and, and adjustments and micro-adjustments. So what is the big overwhelming thing that we could say to our readers to, to say this is important and this is something you should be interested in? Well, you are going to help us in the censor because I think that the press should be very um, tough on exactly that. We don't want a conference that is not going to give us answers. We want something that really shows us the way to go. So please, answer that question to me, if possible, as soon as possible, so that we direct the, the negotiation towards that, because that's exactly what we want. We don't want Rio Plus 20 to be an enormous effort for, at the end of the day, having countries reluctant to commit to things that are going to have a great impact in their economies. That's why in the conference we're going to give so much power to the, the, the NGOs, the, uh, the, the scientific community, etc., etc., in the four days in the middle of the conference, because we want to have also uh, the international community, uh, apart from the formal national governments, to, to have their say in a very strong voice to be brought to the high level. So you are going to help enormously on inspiring countries to do things. I use the word uh, the inspiring, not to use another one. And inspiring the international, uh, I think, um, 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 uh, community, I mean, uh, NGOs, and, uh, and uh, I think the, uh, everybody to, to really see that we have an opportunity here. But we have to make sure that this opportunity really becomes what it can be, which is a once-in-generation opportunity to have people thinking at the future in uh, a way that really inspires and really makes you want to change some things. You are not going to change your patterns of consumption if you think that this is not going to have an impact. You're not going to change the economy uh, if you think that you're going to destroy your country's economy and all these things. So I, I believe that, uh, so please answer the question for us and we'll try to do our best. <laughs> No, no doubt, no doubt about it. This, is a, this has been probably the principle of Rio from 92 that has evolved less is the unsustainable patterns of consumption. This is probably the area in which we had less effort. I think that we have some significant advances in unsustainable patterns of production, but the unsustainable patterns of consumption were really not dealt with and have not inspired, let's say, uh, 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 significant changes, uh, mainstream significant changes. We have some sectoral uh, significant changes, but not so much uh, mainstream. So, um, you know, it's very difficult to, to, to know exactly how we're going to be in June. You saw in the G20, the last G20 meeting in France, uh, President Sarkozy had lots of things in the agenda that he wanted to do. He prepared for a year that meeting, and when the meeting happened, 
that was, it was in the middle of the Greek crisis and at the end of the day everybody only dealt with the Greek crisis and he had a whole year of efforts of having a new agenda that, uh, that did not work in spite of, uh, of a very serious preparation. So obviously the, the degree of the crisis can be something positive or it can be something that, uh, will, that, that will make it more complicated. But what I think is that this crisis shows that uh, that people are not inspired by this model in the future. We we don't see that we that this crisis is just um, a crisis that if you adjust everything will go well uh, um, uh, in the future. So I think this it is in this sense that it is a big opportunity that people are open to changes because let's say that. Uh, since Rio, many of the things we thought were going to be positive processes ended up not being such positive processes. So globalization uh, uh, had very positive impacts, but also had some things that are uh, that leave people quite uh, upset. Uh, um, financial instability, um, migrations. You have all these issues that have um, shown that the model we have now is maybe too short-term um, uh, um, obsessed. And th this is also, and many NGOs uh, point to that, which is a, a, a great challenge uh, to democracy itself, because we, we know that in most uh, big economies um, um, you are planning things uh, taking into account the next election, taking into account the time that you have to realize things, and sometimes sustainable development uh, 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 has to uh, to think of projects of long term, of big uh, state um, policies, as we call in Brazil, when you have a policy that is an agreement of all the, the parties so that it's going to be continued even if you have a change of government. All these issues I think are very interesting to be dealt with uh, and a certain crisis uh, can contribute. So, thank you. Now we have time crisis. Thank you for your patience, your questions, and I hope uh, we, we, you get more and more interested by the conference. Thank you. Thank you.